Robbie. Steven Brooks. Oh my God, that's so excitable. <laughs> so so much energy. We have a very interesting episode today. I didn't know how it was going to be, to be honest. I had this idea of talking about these two movies in the same episode. I think it went pretty well. Yeah, there are kind of the polar opposite of each other but also not yeah it's like you go far enough around the circle and just come right back to where you started yeah you might see this banner and go what those two together how are they gonna explain this i th- i usually do the featured images but every once in a while i'm like robbie can you do this uh, feature image? can you make this special thing i feel like this one i'm gonna want to hand it over to you <laughs> To do the featured image. No, because Rob, you know, you uh, work in the graphics department at The Late Show. This feels right up your alley. First of all, the featured images in general feel right up your alley, but that's usually why I'm doing them because I don't want to get, I don't want to give you the same work that you do during the day. But it's weird because I used to do this uh, just for fun. And then we also kind of, uh, I had a little bit of training for what I do now because of the, these uh, rubber onion banners, learning how to place things correctly i know and we used to sense. do them just back and forth to each other like a picture was taken you put some in the background kind of uh talk about something you put, even before the podcast it was always very fun it's fun just to make like weird stuff yeah. just kind and of and i don't think a lot of people know this but uh, steven when he does his better see he, he tries to put them together where you're like, oh, there's a little joke in there sometimes. There's a little kind of a uh, story he's telling. Nobody ever notices. Yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I think I mentioned this in two, was it 280, 285, right? We had talked about these two companies that were like gobbling up two other companies. And we also talked about Seabeast. So what I did was I took the two companies that were buying, Nintendo and Netflix, and I combined them into one logo and put it on the Seabeast. So they're both red and the Seabeast is red. And then I looked at the Dynamo and the Animal Logic logos and it was both white and blue, two names. It was perfect. So I combined (laughs) Dynamo Logic. It just looked perfect. And I put it down in the blue water because that's also where the blue creature was. From, from do you see the passion i don't know it didn't take very long but i thought nobody nobody (laughs) is gonna get this at all they're just gonna look at it and go oh sea beast oh nintendo netflix that they might get i don't think they're gonna get the whole red logo blue logo dynamo logic i don't think they're gonna get that there's a science to everything this is this is not only steven's uh podcast but this is this is his passion a passion project such as the movies that we're going to review today. Exactly. Thanks for getting that back. So um, (laughs) is there anything else you want to say? Yeah. Normally when it's uh, for me to watch a movie, it's kind of like pulling teeth or uh, you usually have to drag me to see these things. You literally Uh, just had teeth pulled also. Yep. And I'm going to have one put in. The week that this goes up, aren't you getting another tooth? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm getting an implant. It's like life imitating. (laughs) So... I want to say welcome to episode 286 of the Rubber Knee Animation Podcast. A very uh, stop-mo episode, I mm. guess you could say. And we're calling this one... Michelle, Michelle. Mad God as well. Perfect. The other option was Mad God with shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> Mad God with shoes on. I'm Don Bluth. I'm Harry Potridge. Hi, I'm Tom Moore, teenage superhero. My name's Adam Phillips. This is Robert Valley. And I'm in no way uh, doing a forced plug. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <What was> that? <laughs> and you're listening to. <laughs> Sounds like a tongue twister, and you've had the most problem with this. Uh, let's say, say Marcel the shell with shoes on three times. Marcel the shell with shoes on. Marcel the shell with shoes on. Marcel the shell with shoes on. Wow, your third one was right. <laughs> <laughs> three times when a charm. You, <laughs> when you listen to this back, did you did you do that on purpose? No, 
your third one, at least at least to what I heard, maybe maybe it was a, a trick of my ear, but yeah, the third <laughs> the third one you said right. So we'll already have uh, talked about the premise in this uh, episode in the intro, but we're going to talk about these two movies that could not be more different from one another, but they are similar in some ways. So right? like, I just kind of yeah. want to yes, let's let's list some of these off first. They're both I would say passion projects. They're both independently pursued. They both start as shorts, stop motion focused shorts, as a matter of fact. And they're both kind of terrifying in some ways. <laughs> I mean, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that is kind of where the split happens a little bit is is in Marcel the Shell is more emotional and Mad God is more visceral. Abstract, um, maybe. Marcel the Shell has a narrative. Uh, Mad God does not. I mean, I won't say it does. <laughs> it, it has vignettes. Yeah, but we'll get to that kind of um, uh, discussion a bit later. But there is a fair amount of stuff that uh, is comparable. Marcel Deschel, uh, but again, separation. Marcel Deschel has uh, dialogue; it yeah. is uh, dialogue heavy. Mad God is mostly not. So there are obvious differences there, but it is interesting how both are artistic expressions. They're independent pursuits. They started from a small, short form, and then they took years to to develop and come out. When was the first Marcel the Shell? See, now it's hard for me to say. <laughs> when was the first Marcel the Shell short? Was it mid two thousands? I think it might have been maybe even earlier than that. Now that I'm now that I'm thinking about right. it. Um, 2010 ah, okay. is when, when the first one came out. And then there was a, a second one, Marcel the Shell with Shoes on 2. And Marcel the Shell with Shoes on 3. Guess what? Mad God also released Mad God 1, Mad God 2, Mad God 3. Uh, these shorts that had come out until it got then put together. It, basically, I think it showed, I don't know how much of the film... Each one of them was 12-ish minutes for the Mad God shorts. So you're thinking basically half. It's like half the movie, I guess, right? Because yeah. the movie was 85 minutes. And uh, then it develops into this overall thing. And Marcel Shell retains a lot of those shorts, but then it expands on things as well. So there's another connection is the way that the, they had three shorts. Which I didn't except know. Except Mad about. God was like 30 years, uh, <laughs> 30 years separated from, his, from the original idea of Mad God. But when it started kicking off, I think he released the first short in 2014. That's not too far off from Marcel Lachelle, um timeline. There's, yeah, there's a whole kind of difference as far as like production wise. But... I will say, uh, I <laughs> when I tell Leanne about this, because Leanne wanted to see it, but she didn't know the full title. And uh, she uh, thought uh-huh. that you were suggesting we watch it with shoes on. You have to watch Marcel the Shell with shoes on. And <laughs> I thought she was joking. I thought she was like, of course. I mean, yeah, why would we? I mean, why should we wear shoes, though? And I laughed. And she was like, no, I'm being serious. <laughs> it's funny because it's, yes, it is like you're saying Marcel. Marcel, dang it. This is going to be hard. <laughs> Marcel the shell. And then the additional is with shoes on. Yeah. But it is Marcel is the name. And he is the shell with shoes on. Yeah. That's where Bob it the becomes, sponge it, it is, with square pants. It is a hard thing to say. Yes. You know, <laughs> it's a bit like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Where like, you know, I had parents that would say like Teenage Turtles something like that they just kind of take take the, i know they're teenagers i know the turtle it is teenage mutant ninja is hard to say yeah. and there was like mutant turtles they're always just just pick i know it has this and this in here somewhere <laughs> but i think the title kind of helps with the i guess the the comedy aspect of it it helps it with is. the cutesy aspect of it and yeah. i will say that that i read one review that said that it was uh it was adorable, unbearingly so, uh, uh, unbearable so, unbearably so, Unbearable. whatever the word was. Unbearably. Unbearably so. <laughs> there we go. I disagree, but we'll get into our thoughts. Did you see the shorts? So we'll we'll talk about Marcel first. Did you see the shorts? I know I've seen the dumb the thumbnail throughout the years, and I don't think I ever really either. I clicked on it and didn't pay any mind to it. It just seemed like something that just exists and. Mm-hmm. I, I knew about it, but not enough to know like the backstory behind it or anything. I just seen the image of, of Marcel. <laughs> Marcel. Marcel. 
Marshall just seems so much better. Marshall. I I get. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but see, again, it's it's like branding. It's how many things you're going to say. Um, I saw the shorts when they came out. Uh, I thought they were very funny. Um, I had only, I think that was before I really knew who Jenny Slate was. And then, you know, then she was on Parks and Rec. So then she was in a movie called uh, Obvious Child, which I, I she was the, the star. I don't know if um, she helped to write it or anything like that. But that, I think she was working in a bookstore or something. And it was filmed in non-imperialist, unoppressive bookstore. Remember the place in Greenwich Village that John Gorga had oh. Carmine Street Comics in the other half of it? Oh, that exact bookstore. That exact bookstore. Unfortunately, thanks to the pandemic, the bookstore closed. So that's gone, which really, really sucks. Oh, but um, yeah, so that's how I kind of uh, knew knew her is, is uh, through those things. And you were saying... I've seen her just in places, I guess, much, pretty much like Marcel, where I just kind of knew about her, but didn't like really look into her comedy and stuff like that. But I just, I know her from SNL, where she accidentally dropped an F-bomb, and then she kind of disappeared from SNL after that. Oh, I heard about that. She was fired for that, right? I think it was for that, yeah. Wow. Which is kind of a weird reason. I, I mean, I, I understand. Yes, you can't really say things like that on <laughs> on live television. Well, if she I, I, if she starts, <laughs> you can't say that on television. Remember that? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. So it was her, and I think at the time, I guess it was her, her boyfriend, uh, Dean Fleischer Camp. Uh, th- they made it together. He was the he was the the filmmaker the guy. He was the guy with the the camera and editor and stuff, uh, the director. And then uh, she was um, the voice of Marcel. I'm sure that they did other things as well. They did the first short and then they did the second one, the third one. They got married on the process of that. I don't know if they were married when they first started. I didn't really look up the timeline of the relationship, but the point is they were a couple. They got married, uh, but they split before this movie started before they were making the movie. So when they started making the movie, there were all these interviews that were like, Hey, what's it like working with your ex-husband? And they're like, it's fine. Like we, <laughs> we wouldn't do it if, <laughs> if it was going to be a problem. Um, and they had a fine working relationship and it just, there's something about, there's something about the, the, the genuine creation of a short with uh, uh, two people that, care about each other in some capacity they split up and then they come back together to do a longer form version there's a lot of heart behind the movie and i just i feel like maybe some of that behind the scenes emotion i don't know if it ever came into it or how it goes into the writing or how it goes into the editing but it there was a lot of um heavy emotional feelings in the movie that i can't help but think maybe we're helped by the the history behind the camera oh definitely i wonder what the outcome of the movie would have been if they stay together and i mean obviously story-wise the the topic of you know divorce and all this stuff doesn't really it's not really the main focus on the story but it is an aspect of it but i'm sure it would have played differently maybe without them dealing with that i mean we can personally we can talk about the plot if you want to get into that i mean the the animated shorts the big thing was that they were a mockumentary style they were very small and and a lot of it small huh? uh, <laughs> it was very small in scope it was basically just a documentary filmmaker who you know marcel was very happy was like hey you want to see how i do this you want to see how i do this and just kind of uh showed you around his world it was very very cute yeah and in this one smartly so they start out by doing that you know this uh it's it's an airbnb so it's not the same story it's not it's not a complete continuation of the shorts it's like a spiritual sequel um it slightly changes the origin story but i don't think anyone's really going to care because i think a lot of people like you even if they saw it they might not remember where is marcel and how did this thing start and all that all they remember is they remember how cute he was and all the little things that he did and so they start out that way where there is a, a documentary filmmaker who is staying at an Airbnb and he sees Marcel. Uh, Marcel. Oh, my goodness. Marcel. <laughs> this is going to be really difficult. I would say it's a drinking game, but please don't do that. <laughs> Marcel 
sees it as a very interesting subject matter and just starts filming. And so the f- first part, I'd say the first third, is all kind of that stuff from the short. It's, you know, you want to see how I do this? You want to see how I do this? Introducing you to his world. And you get introduced to uh, his uh, grandmother, right? And immediately, I did not know who played his grandmother, but immediately, immediately, I went, that's Isra- Isabella <laughs> Rossellini. Yeah. She has a, such a distinct voice. And if you know anything about her career, she voice work wise and i guess now but she has moved very gracefully into the nice grandmother (laughs) voice (laughs) which is like not how i think about isabella rosalini that whole beginning part i thought was a really good way to ground the film in the shorts and I'm, i'm just gonna say that it is a it is a reveal i guess that they give but i'm not gonna call this a spoiler because it's so obvious that he has split up from his girlfriend and that's why he's in the Airbnb. And the guy who's filming it is actually Dean, the filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> Felt like it gave that extra and and or I couldn't imitating help life. but think that. Yes, a little bit. And I, I got to imagine that they did that on purpose. You know, that that's a, a bit of, you know, this is, you dive yourself into something and in some sort of subject, this mockumentary, but uh, this documentary that he was doing allowed him to focus on someone else. And it's a great foundation for the emotional, uh, <laughs> uh, emotional uh, value uh well the emotional the emotional basis of his <laughs> I <was gonna> arc, <laughs> I, the emotional basis of his arc where he doesn't want to talk about himself he doesn't want to talk about his own issues he wants he's like no you tell me about you and marcel is constantly asking questions he's like don't ask questions to me i'm, yeah. I'm just the documentary i'm just <laughs> i'm just the camera don't ask questions to me but through that, it becomes very cute. You actually get this bond between Marcel and Dean. And because Dean is behind the camera mostly, it's Marcel and you. And it does. it's very good the way that it pulls you into yeah, that. Yeah, you uh, definitely needed place. that relationship with it because it, it couldn't hold up with just focusing on uh, Marcel alone, you know? Um, Marcel, Marcel's very cute, but Marcel needs someone else to. Yeah, and his kind of curiosity of dragging questions out of Dean, and and Dean just trying to kind of like, uh, oh, let's focus more on you. Uh, I love stuff like like it kind of reminded me of um, Creature Comforts. Was it those yes. shorts, you know. Yeah, I thought the first part was really good, but when we we start to have a turn in that second act, yeah. the uh, it, it does say in the plot. You know, they Marcel is uh, kind of talking about wanting to find more like him, right? So they're going to release these mini documentaries up on the internet and get some attention and see if anyone knows of more shells like him and can get some information. And it's this double-edged sword. The popularity comes with... You know, not not anything helpful, right? It's just a lot of people who are coming to the house. Oh, that's the house. You remember when you went to I was thinking of that exact (laughs) thing. I was like, these people are monsters. And then remembering not maybe like five weeks ago, I was in front of the the very famous Simpsons house that gone wrong. So it's good because again, that's another part that really brought you into the shorts because it's almost like the shorts that you were watching are the shorts that they uploaded, right? They had uploaded a few. I didn't count them. I didn't see if they uploaded three, but I would figure the thought that goes into it, maybe they would have uploaded um, a a few of them. And then it's the last act that turns it into something kind of new. But it does feel like the movie, it's this meta plot where they take a little bit of real life Behind the camera, behind the scenes, you know the popularity popularity of Marcel, uh, the the relationship of Dean, and and work it into the narrative of the story, and give it a conclusion, whatever conclusion they want. I thought it was very smart. It was very good. And hey, 
Meta is in. This was released by A24. <laughs> I always say A24 is they either make your favorite movies or your most hated movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they take a lot of risks with their uh, with their work. They do. This is probably the friendliest thing I've seen from them. Uh, as far as I'm, I'm, I'm more used to their their horror movies. I mean, I guess so. But you know, everything, everywhere, all at once was also I thought very. Uh, oh yeah, that's from there. Yeah. And here we get into a little bit more of the crossover. The uh, the animation director of Marcel the Shell, we had talked about. I think it was last week actually, where Kirsten Lepore is the animation director of this and did some visual effects on everything, everywhere, all at once. The other thing that I would point out is that we also said last time that uh, the Chiodo brothers uh, worked on this. And I just kind of feel like, I don't know, there's there's kind of a theme going on of eras, like different eras of stop motion. You know, we're going to get to talk about Phil Tippett in a bit. You have the Chiodo brothers and you got Kirsten Lepore that's, that's coming in. And Kirsten has a very particular style with her stop motion. I think we had listed off things before that she had worked on. I had mentioned Bottle, uh, the uh, Bad Jubies Adventure Time episode, that stop motion episode. She did The High Stranger, which is just that (laughs) weird plasticine guy. (laughs) Hi, Stranger. Really kind of just staring at you in the camera with a big shiny butt. May it, it... took the internet by storm. And then Marcel the Shell with shoes on. And the reason we even brought her up last time was because she's going to be, she's directing the entire uh, five episode short series of I Am Groot up on Disney+. Plus. Oh, wow. But you discovered something of hers recently that blew your mind. Daddy, daddy, hurry. I saw something scurry. Don't be an idiot. It's just a spider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's something that we should uh, we should also mention. The um, uh, the spider, uh, Lucas, right? Lucas the spider. I don't know. It, it's it, the, the tarantula guy. Oh, that's a YouTube kind of uh, character as well, right? I don't think it's actually him. I, I like... I don't really know the uh, foundation of uh, Lucas, but there was some cute spiders that were in the back there. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just thought that was funny. That uh, Now, going into this, did you kind of have a loose idea of what you thought it would be about? Because I was expecting road trip, trying to find, not like a big grand, like they go to a bar and have a bar fight or anything, but just like I thought it was going to be kind of like, Taking the shell out from the home, which they kind of do a little bit, but I thought the, the rest of the movie was going to be focusing on traveling around, trying to find uh, Marcel Marcel's shell family. Yeah, I don't think I <laughs> I don't think I had an idea about what it was going to be, and because it was based off an animated short, uh, really all I was expecting was just you know kind of cute vignettes, not really. Not really anything that had a, a good story structure to it. Definitely not anything that would emotionally move me. Because that's what it felt like when I was watching. I felt like, wow, I, I'm, I'm feeling something here. I'm feeling something uh, pretty intense for these characters. It's, a, of course, a little manipulative. But the best part about the manipulation is that it, it lets you see it coming. And it does something not as manipulative as you might see in a Pixar movie. It actually is like you come on man, you you know what's you know what's coming. Yeah. Let's let's <laughs> let's let's do this together. That's what it felt like. It felt like every time you knew something was coming, the film kind of held your hand as it like walked you over to this thing to like deal with it together. It it didn't feel like it was like you know what's coming, but you don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, I guess in and a I'm way that slap you in the face. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's what Pixar does sometimes. It's like just for just for maximum. Does it make you feel bad? Does it make you feel bad? What if I what what if I told you this? Does that make you feel worse? Does it make you want to cry? Does it make you want to cry, baby? <laughs> <laughs> that's what it felt like when you watch some Pixar movies. I guess which is, they... which doesn't work with me because it's like. Yeah, they did it in a way, well, I guess, where like adults will will kind of lead children into heavy topics that they did in, in the movie. Yeah, a little bit. It's a bit therapeutic, I'd say. And I had brought this up. I just have been telling everyone to go watch it because it's uh, <laughs> like I said, with everything that's going on now, rights being taken away, the future 
being a complete question mark. Who knows? Everything's terrible. New diseases. But <laughs> yes, yeah, we're we got uh, we got a constitutional right that's been ripped away. We got two pandemics. Um, <laughs> someone we were talking recently. You can go on uh, the CDC uh, website. You know, you're looking for. Um, uh, immunizations, right? If you you need to get a, a shot or another booster shot, or looking for the uh, the next one that's coming up in the fall for the next uh, COVID vaccine, and you go to the CDC website looking for like pandemic vaccines, and there's a drop down menu. You can pick either COVID or monkeypox. It's oh, like <laughs> there's a drop down menu for pick your pandemic. It's a, <laughs> it's a really depressing time right now. So going to see Marcel the Shell with shoes on, both in person and the title of the movie, it just, it felt, yeah, it felt good. It felt like not a let's distract ourselves, but the the story actually takes hard themes and confronts it head on in a very mature way and basically just says like it's okay to feel these things it's okay to uh it's okay okay to have the moment to to cry about it uh it's okay to ask for help you know all these things it just felt very necessary right now i guess is what i'm saying it was nice yeah i I mean i will say it is pretty predictable about where everything's going but i I guess it doesn't really necessarily need to be complicated you don't it's not necessary to get tricked into thinking oh i thought one thing was gonna happen and any other thing happened exactly it's less of a roller coaster ride and more of yeah it's it's an experience i i felt like i don't know how how did you feel about it because when i came out of it i felt better so i went with uh my mom my uh nephews and niece and I, originally i was just not too excited about seeing it uh i passed by um movie posters for nope and i was like oh i wish i was seeing that right now instead (laughs) but watching it i do take back what i had said while watching it i was like well this could have just been streamed um i don't know if necessarily if it needs to be a theater experience but but then i started thinking like why doesn't it need to be you know like you should have something like this in theaters as well and plus i feel like i know as much as i enjoyed it I wouldn't be as focused as I am sitting there, as as well as my family. They had to watch the whole thing. No one could get up and do other things or stare at their phone or whatever like that. So it kind of allowed them to kind of really get into the story. And my mom, she's still talking about this movie (laughs) days later. Really? Yeah. Every time I call, I have to call her every single day. If I don't call her, she, she thinks I'm, I've been, I'm missing or I'm dead or something. So I call her and she's like, yeah, I was talking to Romeo, my nephew. And uh, we, were, we were talking about Marshall. And like she was doing a YouTube deep dive. Oh, did you know the person who does the voice is blah, blah. So I, most of my research came from my mom <laughs> telling me <laughs> about the backstory. Oh, they were together. And it was just like, oh, wow. So it, they really liked it. When we got out of the theater... Uh, my nephew, who has like a deep voice now, he's taller than me. He's like, uh, uncle in Spanish is Theo. He goes, Theo, I almost cried, yo. <laughs> and, and I think we all. <laughs> is exactly what I'm talking about with this movie. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it is a it weird beautiful. thing. You do get a little, uh, uh, there is a, a, a part where you're inside yourself saying, are you really crying from a, a googly-eyed shell? Yes, I am. <laughs> That's exactly. So when you said it is a bit predictable, that's what I'm saying about um, uh, it it not being it, it's like anti manipulative is it yeah. doesn't it's it's also like it's not like you can't see what's coming coming. And there's there's not twists, really. I mean, there's like there's developments, but that's what's so good about it is that it that's not the point. The point is this is what life is. This is, you know, e- even a lot of times you can see what's coming. And even if you can see what's coming, even if you, you know, what's, uh, you have to deal with it. And there are some unexpected things that, that happen, but for movie goers, obviously you'll see it and go like, okay, I know where this is going, but it's a, it's a very solid foundation. It's a very solid structure. 
uh, for the movie and the way it's done is very good. I think that we should probably talk about the visuals now because the other part of it is the way it's shot is very good, right? There's uh because it's documentary style, uh, it's also very, very small. So it's kind of macro photography. And you would think that what they would do is, I think we talked about this, that you thought that it was uh, CG replicating yeah stop motion yeah so you'd think that's what kind of they would do and i'm sure that there's some visual effects uh, stuff that goes in there 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 always is uh, to some extent but it is stop motion and it is that small they didn't do things like make a much bigger shell and uh, put it on a uh, sized up set <laughs> um, i mean they they did basically they recreate um these sets these close-up sets whenever they have to be in an environment so they can kind of control it my thought would be stuff like uh plants i mean i i read some things i didn't really see a lot of behind the scenes uh, footage but i think anything like plants or something that is alive that might change in uh in in color position uh throughout the day or uh from one day to the next they want to control that um and they want to uh, set design certain things like uh if they have to be inside a drawer or on top of a dresser or on a windowsill or something you want to recreate that set so you can have uh expected you can control the lighting and you can control the ability for your stop motion animators to get in and out of these uh, spots so they can, you know, animate the characters. Yeah, that makes sense. But then those, the shells, I mean, it really was small. Um, I think the original Mar- Marcel, the shell was actually a shell, but in this one, obviously you have to have multiple different shells. You can't just use the same one. And everyone knows that with stop motion. There's always like multiple different versions of a puppet. And, uh, when you're filming it up close that much, you can't <laughs> also, it would be terrible to like base your entire movie off of one shell. They essentially needed to, <laughs> I think they 3d scanned it. I don't know if they built it. But All they, right. We're ready for our next shot. It. Where, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> Movies canceled. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so they 3d printed uh, these shells, which it seems like a no brainer when, <laughs> when you talk about it, when you think about the production aspect of it, but when you're watching it, you don't really think about it that much. It is, um, it is a bit rough. The texture is a bit uh, rougher than what you might imagine a shell is. So I think when you're watching it, if you have any sort of um, experience in that area, you might be able to tell. I mentioned that um, the Chiodo brothers were involved. So Kirsten Lepore is the animation director. Then you have Steven Chiodo, who spells his name correctly, by the way, with a PH. As yeah. I do, as right. all correct <laughs> spelling should be. Um, so he was the supervising animation director. And then his brother, Edward, is the uh, animation producer. And that's uh, how they did that. I, my feeling is probably they had... <laughs> I'm not going to say that they got him as a name, uh, you know, but I think Kirsten Lepore probably did the bulk of the work and then the Chiodo brothers were there for uh, supporting uh, the the stuff that was being done. That's my assumption, not saying they weren't doing anything, but my, from all the behind the scenes photos that I, that I saw, like Kirsten was there constantly. So I, I f- just assume that she did most of the work. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really sure what the Chiodo brothers did, but uh, you know, having, having legends like that on set ready to, pick their brain or uh, help out with the the production and assist in, in uh, uh, the production of the movie. I think it really made it look, it all came together very good. The cinematography was good. Uh, the live action stuff was very good. The look of it, the processing was very good. I think the way that they dealt with light also felt very necessary because it does deal a lot with light and dark and when it's uh, gloomy outside or when it's, uh, you know, rainy outside. I feel like those kinds of things, it's hard to give that kind of texture to your movie without bringing attention to the cinematography. And it was just very good. It felt very seamless. It felt easy. Do you know what I mean? The, like the mouth shapes in this one, I, I, a lot different than the shorts. I don't know whether in the shorts they they still had it added after, but this one was obviously placed after uh the stop motion stuff. Right. What you're going to want to do 
And it's kind of um, robot chicken in that way. You yeah. Know, just kind of, you know, sticking on. But they had a few things like there's a <laughs> there's a road trip scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Um, oh, that's another connection between this and Mad God. Lots of vomit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to- totally different. <laughs> Totally different vibe. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's, it's small. <laughs> <laughs> is that your is that your Jenny Slate as Marcel yeah. impression? Oh, I did notice Marcel sounds like a who was that character from uh Comedy Bang Bang? The little Oh, oh uh it's, um I get a little stabby. Yeah, yeah. A little orphan boy. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what his what his name was. Uh Moynihan? Bobby Moynihan? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Um, yeah, this movie made me appreciate, I guess, little knickknacks. <laughs> I like to collect small things and see uh, if I was tiny, what would I use as furniture? Like their couch was a hot dog bun. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the bread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the bread bed. I mean, which is not really a great idea because it, it will just mold. But. Um. So, and another thing that I want to mention is obviously if you if you go. I would encourage you to not go on the IMDb and look at who is in the movie because I feel like even just the cast list is uh it's it's more fun to watch the movie and then go I think to IMDb after the fact. But there there's a lot of names in here that you will recognize and uh there's there's just there's just one person in particular that's in the credits that was one of my favorite. Again, it's not really a reveal. It's more like as soon as they bring it up, it makes you laugh, and then they fulfill on that <laughs> promise later, and it's just very funny. Anyway, so animation-wise, very, very cute. Uh, the motion is very cute. The look is very cute. Everything's very cute, but it's um, it's kind of a combination sometimes of stop motion and live action things. You know, when stuff falls, uh, that would be live action. Uh, rolling around, I, I think sometimes it's live action, sometimes it's it's stop motion, um, it's been a while since I've seen it, so I, I can't really remember exactly. I think the combination of the stop motion stuff and the live action stuff was very uh, good. It was it was handled very well. The macro photography, like I said, also was very good. But more importantly, I know everything about that house and the yard. Like I I knew right that first third. They introduce you to every place. And the function of, of him going, this is where I do this, and this is where I do this, and this is where this happens, and over here we have this. <laughs> it's kind of introducing to the place, and it's it's a, a wonderful way to introduce the setting. So whenever anything is happening in the house or in the yard, you know exactly how far one thing is from another thing. And relating to how far it is for a human <laughs> like yeah. is it on the is it is it outside is it inside is it on the other side of the uh, of the house and what that means for marcel how easy or how hard it is for marcel to get there anyway i, I thought I all that the, stuff was done very well and yeah the way marcel works around living in this place and traveling through a uh, through a, a ball a handball i think it was yeah tennis it ball. was a uh, yes <laughs> a handball <laughs> But I think, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's helpful, I think, to – it kind of, yeah, shines a light on people who may have, like, certain disabilities or something who kind of struggles with, um, you know, normal things around the house that are kind of difficult to to operate sometimes and um, without having something – I don't know. I, I think in a way people can see it like that, you know, just different kind of meanings to things like that, whether they're trying to express that or not. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, um, That's a really good insight, I think. Is there anything else that you want to say about the movie itself or the uh, the visuals of it? Yeah, visually, it it made me want to do more kind of like stop motion. It kind of helps you think like you don't have to build a set all the time. You can use like your house as a background. Your house can be its own world. I think that they handle technology well like social media and stuff. It wasn't like, you know, they use TikTok, they use YouTube, they use all this other stuff, but but they didn't do it in a way where we'll watch this two years later and go, oh, that's so dated. <laughs> you know, I think they handled that kind of aspect of it really well. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it's, it's fun to see objects like that kind of in movement. And they didn't necessarily have to explain why this shell was alive. 
You know, it's not like he, oh, he rented the Airbnb and said, wait, you you talk? And then that's where the movie starts. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I was trying to think there was something else that I wanted to bring up. And that's what <laughs> they you completely bypass that. <laughs> a live action animated character hybrid issue of like what, what, what? <laughs> you can talk yeah i just you know it's they completely bypass that it's just this is just the way it's just the way that it is and uh that's it and then you just you just go from there but very enjoyable i don't know if i need to see it again if that's a weird thing to say no it's not a weird thing to I say i feel like there's a like lot of movies that it. are like that i'm probably gonna watch it again again next time i'm feeling a little a little crappy but i don't think i don't think i can watch it more than one time maybe a year you know it kind of fills you with uh with that kind of feeling and i might buy it when it comes out on streaming you know to have it uh have it always in my digital library so whenever i just want to you know pop it open and and watch it because i do feel like there are scenes that i want to revisit and go back to i like when he's going around i like i like him in the car there's a couple other scenes that are also very fun that are just kind of nice things to to watch. And even from the animation, I think, is is subtle. It's a subtle thing, but it's done so well that it does kind of, yeah, fill you a little bit with that inspiration, that feeling of uh, uh, the, the guerrilla filmmaking kind of thing to go out there and, and do it. Even though this is a full movie with a full crew behind it, it feels lo-fi. And it brings you in. And it, it, like I said, the whole movie could be considered a, a handholdy movie, but in a good way, not in a, you know, ugh, won't you just like leave it up to me? You know, you don't need to hold my hand, but yeah, this is better that way. I think I definitely know my mom's going to watch it at least 10 more times. That's amazing because, and also a really good point about going to the theater there are some things even for people who watch movies and i think that we'll talk about that uh in like 30 seconds when we move on to the next movie (laughs) but uh i feel like that's something where even people who watch movies who enjoy movies and appreciate movies you watch it at home there's a tendency to take your phone out and look at it if if it's on or if it's not You know, you might want to just make sure you're not missing a call or something like that. But when you're in a movie theater, you have to turn your phone off. You know that you're just there. You're experiencing it. You're with other people, yes. But I think that even if there's just one other person in there, it's different than if you're watching it by yourself or if you're watching it in a very comfortable atmosphere to where, yeah, you can get up and you can go get something or you can go to the bathroom or you could pause it. You could you kind of disrupt that experience and... It's very interesting, especially since your animated shorts that you did with your family and watching movies with your mom, uh, trying to show her a movie that you like, uh, that one for Mother's Day, where she's doing anything you uh, and your dad, like doing anything but watching it. <laughs> You're like, oh, watch, 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 watch this, watch this. Um, the fact that, you know, being in a theater, this feels like the kind of movie that if you put it on, yeah, it would just be a background thing. We're like, oh, that's funny. Watching it in the theater actually gave your family an, an emotional reaction. They had an emotional reaction to it. So much so that your mom wanted to like follow up on stuff and do YouTube research. I'm, I'm going to have to just like have every movie. I'm going to rent a theater and just every time we watch a movie, have it be uh, <laughs> shown that way. So they have no choice. You know what? Going with the whole Chiodo Brothers thing, you should uh, kill a clown's round of space. You should just Ooh. do that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think. So get <gasps> and the, the animated response. short that you show that you show before it is uh, Hello Stranger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, hey, sorry, Hi Stranger, not Hello yeah. Stranger. <laughs> <laughs> it's the proper version. Hey, Mom, you like okay. the show to show so much. Check this out. Hello Stranger. Wait. From shell to hell. Nice. Very nice transition. <laughs> uh, Mad God. Okay, we've we've talked about something that makes you feel very good. Makes you feel very positive. <laughs> uh, to to now this movie. Um, I want to start by reading off a, a, a couple things here that I had written down. Um, oh, did I say in the beginning, stop motion and live action? Did I say that was a comparison between I think Marcel you just said stop Mad motion. God? But yeah. Oh, okay. There's it's another uh, uh, it's a, another link. It's stop motion and live action. But I wanted to start with uh, this. We got uh, some 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 visual stuff that I wrote down. Vomit. 
excrement, pus, <laughs> eyeballs, deformations, similar looks between different features. And what I mean is like uh, a hand that looks like a foot or a knee bent forward versus, uh, you know, bent backwards. At one point during the movie, and I'm not kidding, I thought what I was looking at was the front of the creature and then i was like wait is that the is that the butt and then some stuff comes out of what i thought was the mouth but it could be the anus and i could not figure out what it was perfect example of where we are with this movie the, the, this list i think perfectly encapsulates the feeling of uh of mad god but you're right it is it's just a trip through hell yeah i was trying to describe this in the best way as possible and i, I thought i figured like damien the child of Satan's toy box. It's just a world of madness. It's it's a world. It's the world under Sid's bed in Toy Story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a bunch of. And, and I want to say that I think, okay, just like Marcel, and I again, this is why we're talking about both of these because <laughs> the more that I thought about it, the more I thought there's some weird similarities between these movies that I keep even as we're discussing I keep discovering more of them there was a response to Marcel the shell that we said there was the uh, unbearably cute uh, kind of thing where yeah that's the point that's exactly why it's there and if you didn't appreciate it you didn't get it then you didn't get it most people did some people didn't like uh, I don't know this that thing and I think it was the Washington Post that said that so mad god is another side of this there's there's no real dialogue. There's some talking in there, but it's not it's not what you expect. Anyway, yeah. point is Mad God is this visceral experience. It's kind of vignettes. It's like you start out doing one thing and then you get pulled over into this other thing and it's a completely different world. And you're like, are we still telling the same story? Just abandon that from the get-go. In the beginning, you'll see the start of one story and then there's kind of a conclusion i guess to that the first time you fade to black and then you go to something else just know like that's what you're getting it's it's that and then you kind of go to another thing and go to another thing it does wrap around and that's kind of where i feel like it doesn't have a narrative but it does have a structure yeah and what you take out of it is kind of it's your own it's your own thing i think a lot of people are reading into very much the word God and the fact that it starts with a, an entire passage from Leviticus. <laughs> I'm not going to say that that wasn't his point, but it feels very purposeful to make it a little obfuscated so that you can kind of pull your own stuff in there. My point about the comparison with Marcel the Shell is that like, I think a lot of people are watching it and going, I don't, you know, why, why, why isn't it not uh why isn't it a story? Why isn't it a narrative? It's uh it's not because that's not the point. Why is it so cutesy? Because that was the point. You <laughs> said that Marcel was very predictable, but that was one of the benefits of it. It was predictable and that's what it wanted to do. It wanted to, Hold your hand through this uh, through this thing. Mad God is the complete opposite of that. It's not holding your hand as much as putting a hook in your back and <laughs> dragging you along. Yeah, it, so there's a there's some comparisons. First of all, off the bat, I didn't know what I was expecting, and I was excited to see this because you hear you know thirty years in production, you you are curious, and I think for the most part, I kind of got what I expected. But I was also a little like, I know that 20 year old Rob, who was really into like Brothers oh, Quay. Oh, man. Brothers Quay. And like, I wrote down some other names here um, uh, as far as like inspirations here Jan Schwenkmeyer. <laughs> uh, yes if you just say yawn and stop motion like creepy stop motion yeah. everyone knows what you're talking about. <laughs> stuff like that i oh my god i would eat it all up i would try to recreate it uh i'm gonna see if uh you know I, I i've done stuff similar to this and of course tool music videos um so there is a part of me that kind of got out of that phase but still has an interest towards it and watching this i was almost a little disappointed in myself 
more than the film itself because I know that 20 year old Rob would have worshipped this movie but watching it mm. now I was sitting alongside of uh, with Leanne the guy took 30 years to make this she couldn't give it 30 seconds I... <laughs> well okay I will say th- yes there is something about uh, the, the okay did you show her the trailer at all before no Okay, I think you. She's not the audience for this. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely not. But what I'm interested in is you are definitely the audience for this. Yeah. Now you are also very susceptible to influence to from the the person you are watching it with, as we have said many times. <laughs> oh, so do you, you think showing that? me? Yeah, you showing me some some stand up that you're like, oh yeah, I love this guy, and then we watch it, and I don't. I don't even crack a smile <laughs> and it makes you so awkward. And you're like, I don't know. It, like I ruined it for you. Um, I feel like maybe that had something to do with it. If she it, like, you know, it's someone that you care about sitting right next to you on the couch. You're sitting down to watch this thing and it kind of pulls you out of the moment. You can't, I feel like if you had watched this on your own, you might have a different reaction. I suppose. Yeah. I guess. Cause it, it, it there were some moments where I just started laughing because it was so, <laughs> obscure and just uh, and and weird and like you just see these guys getting electrocuted and liquid is just pouring out of their butts and i just start laughing because it would it just seemed like i was putting leanne through some kind of like test or something like you re- you want to marry me now <laughs> you happy you married me I, I was gonna say uh you're already married yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's that, that, that. <laughs> any regrets <laughs> that ship has sailed. But no, I, I I do honestly think though, even if I watched it alone, I I would have been a little conflicted because it's not really a movie mm. I think that you can can rate because it just feels like this is something since it's a passion project and and how long he worked on it, it almost feels like someone showing you their their a picture of their child or something like that, and you just go like, okay. Well, let's actually talk <laughs> about that because. Um, I feel like that's really more of a marketing thing that like it took 30 years to make. It didn't yeah. take 30 years to make. The way that happened was, um, well, let's talk about uh, Phil Tippett first, right? Phil Tippett, if you don't know about Phil Tippett, we talk about him as a, a stop motion uh, legend. Let me just give you some of his uh, credits here. Uh, as far as in his uh, visual effects, he, do you remember, <laughs> do you remember, well, I'll start with Star Wars because everyone knows Star Wars. All right, the 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 at at walkers and all that, all that stop motion that you saw, that was Phil Phil Tippett, um, and he pioneered this type of stop motion called go motion, which very simply described when you are taking a still image of something that is in motion. Obviously, there is no blur to it, right? Um, go motion. What it does is uh, the idea is essentially with each one of those uh, shots, you are adding a bit of movement into it. You're adding a bit of blur into the thing that is supposed to be moving. Um, There's a whole series behind it. There's a whole thing. I encourage you to go uh, read about it and look it up. It's all very interesting. Not very easy to describe on a podcast, I think. So let's just start with that. So he does a lot of stop motion stuff, a lot of miniature stuff. Um, Piranha. If you saw Piranha, wonderful little creatures <laughs> in tanks and things, all very fun. Um, Dragon Slayer, I don't know if you saw that, but there's amazing uh, visual effects in that, and he worked on that. A Temple of Doom, um, he did a lot of stuff with ILM, so he was always a kind of a consultant uh, throughout all of ILM stuff. That will lead us up to things later. There was, if you remember Howard the Duck, uh, that whole transformation scene that was in there was great. Um, Ewok adventure, very similar. Yeah. Lots of stop motion. Let's. Uh, I'm trying to go in order here. Uh, the Golden Child, RoboCop, Willow. Then you get up to 1990 with RoboCop 2. And after RoboCop 2 is when he thought of Mad God and he started making Mad God. So about 1990. And he did make this stuff on his own. That's where the passion project started. Okay, so that was 1990. He did RoboCop 3 
1993. So notice there's a bit of a, a gap there. And then Jurassic Park. I think everyone kind of knows the story behind that, but if you haven't seen it, you should, you know, the, the movies that made us documentary up on Netflix has a whole little bit about this portion, but it, basically anything you read or see about <laughs> Jurassic Park, you'll see this. And on the DVD specials, you can see the stop motion tests that were done. There was a whole thing with uh, the Raptors. The Raptors in this stop motion test originally had like lizard like tongues where they were kind of, you know, like snakes, you know? Yeah. And they were walking around. They did uh, uh, that. And then there was a stop motion. I think uh, they did a stop motion T-Rex. But Phil Tippett was doing all that. And that was the original idea. They were going to use stop motion for, or sorry, go motion <laughs> for Jurassic Park. And then ILM, s- small group at ILM. Remember, he did a lot of work with them. Uh, this was around the time when computers were really reaching that point where they could do some really great stuff with uh, uh, with uh, models and uh, and texturize them and they created this t-rex that they were going to use for very they were going to use basically the computer stuff for very uh, very small things that were like far away right and the story goes it was a very small crew they built this model out one guy i think did the walking animation and showed it to Steven Spielberg, and Phil Tippett was there looking at it at the same time, and he just said, that's it. Stop motion is dead. He just thought, this is it. I'm seeing stop motion being replaced right now. The computer yeah. can now do better than I can do in stop motion in a way that is you know, more controlled. And they kept him on as animation supervisor, uh, or sorry, dinosaur supervisor, but basically... Yes, they could do it, but the animation portion of it wasn't something that they had skill in. So they, I think it was very, very smart to have Phil Tippett on to help out with the animation portion of these dinosaurs expressing through computer. And then after that, he was he was in all sorts of computer model things. It start, it, it, Tippett Studios or whatever had turned over to other things. Starship Troopers, uh, Dragonheart, uh, Evolution... All those, and then all the Twilight sagas. That's kind of the path that you have for Phil Tippett. He stopped Mad God in 1993-ish, probably somewhere around 1992, when he was working on Jurassic Park. When he saw that thing on computers and he was like, stop motion is dead. I think he actually said... I can't work on this anymore. I'm extinct or something (laughs) to that nature. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. It's very... Yes. I don't know if that's (laughs) apocryphal. or I have heard him actually say that. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if you just made that joke, but I have heard him actually say that. So you think he just stopped because he thought like it was almost like a a depression thing about like... It wasn't a depression. It was just like, well, nobody's going to buy this. Like stop motion is... Computers are not going to be that thing. And by the time that I finish this, nobody's going to want to buy it. And so he just, and maybe it was a little bit of depression, but I think it was a little bit more like, oh God, I need to change. He adapted his career over to computer. Uh, so his entire thing was going to stop motion. He's like, oh, no, we have to, we have to go with the times and moved it over to computer modeled animation, which is a very, very smart thing to do. And that's why his studio, that's why his uh, company's still around and still doing things. But he dropped it. He had this passion project for Mad God and just uh, eliminated it. So he started it in around 1990-ish and then stopped it around 1993-ish. And he was working on it on his own in between other projects and things. So So he didn't get super far. It wasn't until somewhere in the 2010s that people at his company, I think, saw the footage that he had made and was like, Phil, (laughs) you got to do this. You got to like keep this going. And they encouraged him to do it. And so that's when he went back to it. I think they released the first short before they did the Kickstarter, but then they ended up doing the Kickstarter, trying to raise like tens of thousands of dollars, ended up raising somewhere in the $100,000 range in order to finish uh, the film. And they had released two more shorts as part of, I think, that process and then finished the film. It's crazy. I don't remember the shorts being really like, have you, did you watch them when, when they were? I watched the first one. I think we actually talked about it on the podcast, like when it was first released. Oh, wow. Okay. But 
the point is, yes, it it's took him 30 years to make meaning that he started it back in 1990, but that doesn't mean that he was working on it all that time. And even now, when it came up to the 2010s, he wasn't working on it 100% of the time. They It was a lot of uh, uh, students and interns and things that had come to work at the studio. They They worked on it on like weekends, on Saturdays to put in a shot or two to get some experience. And that's kind of how the thing was built. It was like, well, this is a passion project and we'll do this in between the stuff that we're actually getting paid for. And the Kickstarter, I think, was uh, the way that Kickstarter should be used, which is just to just to get it over the finish line. Yeah. You, know? you got to put in that work up front and then like, this is just to kind of get us someplace. Because there's a lot of stuff about how do you get distribution? How do you, you know... And I think Shutter is the perfect place for it. I don't know if we mentioned that, but we've mentioned it multiple times on the on the show. Shutter is AMC is owned by AMC. It's a exclusively horror uh, themed streaming service, and it's perfect place for it. Oh, I love when he when you turn on Shutter. Doom 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 immediately puts you in the mood. Not a sponsor. And it's also <laughs> great every time you open it up. Yeah, every time you open it up, it has the. It, I think it starts with the uh, slash X. It has that channel that's just just playing movies. Like you don't even have to choose anything. You literally just turn it on, and it's like turning on a channel. Yeah. And then if you don't want that, you can go to whatever the uh, the featured is. So you can go to like you know. Yeah, I hope this uh, paves the way of more uh, horror animation on that on that platform. Well, I wanted to talk about that. I just wanted to mention a bit about Phil Tippett and his career and the way that you get here. Because yes, 30 years to make, but it's actually a bit more like, it's not bad, but it's a a bit more like 10 years, really, I think, if you're thinking about it. And I think functionally, that's what Marcel was. I think from the time that they started to the time that they released it, I think it was about about 10 years. um, Could uh, you tell the the difference between uh, the stuff that was filmed 30 years ago and the stuff that was filmed recent i mean there's very obvious changes i have a f- in, yes in film but i have a feeling yeah there's okay so that's let's talk about the animation style then uh it's a mix of stop motion uh some visual effects computer visual effects a lot of compositing uh then there's live action acting uh there's footage and there's also something called pixelmation which is uh 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 pictures of a person kind of reminded me uh who's the guy is it james lee i think it's james yeah yeah james lee he does these things on youtube have you seen he did tarboy back in the day um his most popular thing was like breaking up with adobe i don't know if you saw that oh okay oh yeah 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 yeah. so there are some shots yeah and he's got the glasses that are like glowing white light and uh he takes pictures kind of looking Yes, yes, right. It's kind of like um, uh, Sin City. Yeah. But he takes pictures and with a lot of processing and uh, uh, will take out certain frames to make it look stop motion. I'm sure that there's another process in there. My assumption is that he might film doing the same thing multiple times and then kind of like chop out uh, chop out frames from each one of them so that it so it doesn't look too perfect. But anyway, there's a, a thing called pixelmation, which if you ever saw those old <laughs> YouTube videos of someone like they they jump up in the air and they look like they're sitting and they take a picture and then they walk forward a foot and then jump in the air and look like they're sitting. Oh yeah, and yeah. you put all those together and it looks like they're floating sitting. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, that's pixelmation. So there's that. So you actually have live action footage, but then you have people that have been uh filmed through pixelmation somehow it ends up all working and it i think it really just works because there's so many different creatures i will say that if you're watching it the only thing that i would say to pay attention to if you want to try to find your own meaning and your own narrative in there is to pay attention to the sizes is you have you start out with a with a character and then it goes someplace and then interacts with other characters that are a certain size and those characters will come back at another time and the relative sizes of the characters i think could probably help you develop your own metaphor of what's going on there i liked that it worked that way relatively seamlessly but some of the stop motion you could tell like some of it was incredibly smooth and some of it was a little jittery i feel like 
in another movie that would have been distracting. And in this one, it totally worked. So I think maybe if you pressed me, I might be able to tell some of the stuff that was older. But I also can't really tell if that was older or if that was just someone a little bit more junior yeah. that had worked on it. You know what I'm saying? The Yeah, some of the like the stop motion I thought was really good. Um, but I didn't enjoy a lot of the live action shots. Because I feel like it right. was film. I don't want to be like sound like a film snob, but it, I feel like it looked very like a digital kind of filming, and it kind of took me out of the the world itself. I totally get that. It did feel. <laughs> what was the movie uh, again? Another Kickstarter thing. It was the crazy. It was like a cop fighting like a werewolf or something like that. It was a uh, oh, man. We talked about it a long time ago in the in the double digit uh, episodes. Um, anyway, <clears throat> yeah, it's the it's filmed and it's composited in, and yeah, it feels a little bit different. There was that one scene where the guy is uh, reaching into a body and he's pulling out all these like coins and pearls and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, things, gooey things, and you have that either filmed at twenty four frames and then brought down to twelve. Or it was done in Pixelmation. I have a feeling it was filmed and then like the frame rate was adjusted. That stuff felt like it worked maybe a little bit more than the stuff that was just straight up full frame live action. Yeah. That being said, this is my point about the pay attention to the size differentials of the characters. Because not all live action characters are the same size. And I feel like that texturally can help you out a little bit uh, about which ones which ones which there there's definitely like a uh, a difference between some of the the live action shots but it, it also animation wise some of it looked like a uh, nightmare before christmas and mm-hmm. some of it yeah. was uh rankin basque there are so many things in here that i i've done myself that i felt like the zooming in on an eyeball and having an eyeball kind of like and the eyeball around, move around yep some mm-hmm. teeth and stuff there, there is some direct like, also very brothers quay yeah there's some direct channeling i wonder if what his inspiration was to like go there because i know like a lot of the stuff he does is creature work and stuff but um stuff like focusing on little just kind of weird it just seemed like weird pockets of different things a, a different well uh, i think that was also a tonally thing you know i i wrote down some other things here there was a uh, uh, parasites, cellular replication, surgery, endoscopy. They're uh, just things. I, it feels like a vision board of unsettling things. It's just like what, what, <laughs> what things might bother you? And and yeah, sure. One of them would be a close up uh, eyeball, or more importantly, seeing too much of an eyeball. Yeah. So I think that's uh, another thing where. You can see an eye moving around, but I think the thing that makes it really unsettling is if you see too much of the curvature of the eyeball. If you just see too much of the roundedness, it's like it feels like the skin is pulled back or the eyeball is sticking out a little too far. You know what I mean? You're just seeing too much of the ball itself. It's just kind of <laughs> yeah. weird. I don't know if you're familiar with the, I wrote down another name that's going to be hard to pronounce. <clears throat> Haramius Bosch? paintings but oh uh, yeah 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 but oh yeah of course it remind me of kind of walking into one of those paintings different layers of hell and story-wise i think that there it is kind of linked together with that one character the name of the character is um uh, uh, the assassin i think people were saying oh yes like yeah that. the i think that's the the guy in the gas mask right yeah by the way uh Heron- hieronymus bosch ah there we go he did a, a, a Garden of Earthly Delights, yeah. that uh, thing. Which, painting, very good. Uh, look up look up close to it uh, as you're going around. You can go, oh, yeah, it's just a little, the, the stuff over on the right with uh, hell. Okay, yeah, that's, that's nice. And then you kind of go around to different places and you go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is... Some of this stuff feels... Not great <laughs> in depictions of of people. Uh, anyway, I don't know if you've seen it recently, but yeah, there there are moments in here where it's it, there was a towards like the third act where it's very eraser head. Oh sure, yeah, 
And um, and then one the part ba- the baby. Yeah. Uh, there's there's so many things in here. I think there's also two thousand one Space Odyssey. Uh, <laughs> and I, this is gonna sound so stupid, but nine. Remember that? I yeah, thought about nine. nine as well. Yeah. Oh, you did. I did watching it. I was like, I feel like I didn't watch nine, but I feel like this. As a kid, I thought this was what nine was gonna look like. Man, if you combined the visuals of this <laughs> with like a story structure of like nine, <laughs> I think I think it would have been more popular. But I don't think Phil, I mean, Phil's worked on like a ton of, I'm, I'm, we're on first name basis now. I, I feel like he's worked on so many big properties and so many things. And he's to the point where he's like, no, this is my vision. I just, I want to do some like, he's kind of um like Terry Gilliam in that way. I feel like Terry Gilliam also is, he is a bit more, a bit more on a story uh, structure base. Like he's kind of uh, obsessive about things like that, but he also doesn't really compromise his vision. He's this is what I want, and this is what I'm going to get. Yeah, it's and it's interesting Phil to see. Tippett maybe is maybe a little bit more loosey goosey about it. He's like, I could see him looking at something and going, "Looks great." <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. disgusting. Perfect. He's having fun. I think he's having fun with this, and is it the thing is? Yeah, it's not perfect, and I like that. I think what I what kind of made me not like it. In some ways, were the whenever I watch anything that's too experimental, uh, there's a lot of kind of um, what's the what's the art phrase? Oh, I just had it in my head. Abstract, abstract kind of stuff where it's just kind of I get a little mm-hmm. loss. Um, but some of the worlds I really like because I feel like for me it doesn't seem like this big world. It still feels like I know. It's in a studio on a table. Feels like you're on the set, and it doesn't feel like you know what I also. This you know world. what I also got a little bit is uh, like box head and round head, um, uh, kind of world development where there was just a lot of when you go to a new place. It's just seeing seeing little vignettes of of uh, this this thing's gross over here, and this thing's gross <laughs> over here, and this thing's you know it's most of the movie is is passing by things being squished or destroyed or tortured or something like that. Yes. Yeah. You're in a haunted it, house. Um, kind of little... You're on the Willy Wonka boat. Yes. <laughs> and this is just all the stuff that's shown on the walls. I will say though, cause you were saying it sounds like he's having fun. And you also said at one point you laughed. I'm, I'm going to say that I think it's on purpose. I think there is, I think there's elements of comedy in this. I don't think it is, uh, it's not a comedy, but there are scenes in it. I think the reason that it's hard to it's hard to see if that was on purpose or not is because there's such disturbing scenes. But then there's other things that are like just slapsticky and just kind of funny and and the absurdity of it. There's I'm thinking of a scene where um, all these little uh, these little putty guys are just getting like squished and destroyed in different ways, and I I got to imagine that conceptual there's a bigger conceptual thing that's very bleak and uh, nihilist yeah about it but on the micro scale that's just what you're seeing in front of you it's it's funny <laughs> it's just <laughs> silly it makes me sound like a psychopath but when you watch it i think that if overall you have this very bleak look at the world, but then some of the stuff that you're seeing, like, you know, they're getting shocked, electroshocked. It's terrible. They're being forced to work and they're being tortured. But then, yeah, that they're just, they're just <laughs> pooping. And then there's, there's another thing where it goes into this creature's mouth kind of thing. And it goes down to tubes and gets pressed down to something else. And that's where you end up with these other people. And uh, it, it just, it jumps back and forth between, disgusting and really disturbing and slapstick and kind of funny. And I think that's where you get the phrase tone poem from where it's just, you're watching it and he's just giving you a feeling. It's almost orchestral where in a song you may, they may actually tell you with words what the song is, or you may hear it through the music, what the story is. 
And you might be able to bring your own interpretation of what the story is, even if it's different than what the person who wrote the song is. Because it's more about something that is not spoken. It's more felt. And I feel like it's that, but through visuals. I did like the music and the sound design was very good. Um, I don't know if you I felt that as well. I did wonder if if this would have benefited if they uh, more if they got in contact with some band and kind of did maybe a Pink Floyd kind of soundtrack overlay to make it almost like I guess a concept that might have worked. I guess that might have worked, but I liked so the music was by Dan Wool and I really liked it. I thought it was it was very good, but it didn't to your point i guess you maybe would have wanted a band like a recognizable band to uh yeah have have written an entire album for the movie and that's not a bad idea to lay some texture to it but i think the music that they did was very good it's almost like it's like fantasia but without recognizable songs you know it's like horrifying fantasia that set more to the music is made for the visuals as opposed to the visuals made for the music. Yeah. Um, so it's like reverse Fantasia, I guess. <laughs> the sound design by Richard Beggs. And I just wanted to shout that out too because the sound design was very creepy. Um, oh, that's another thing. Uh, you know how I said all the things that make you feel bad just up on a vision board? I think they did that with sound as well. Okay, things screeching, uh, things <laughs> sloshing. And crying baby, <laughs> uh, you know, bones crunching, you know, all those kinds of what just makes you feel uncomfortable. If crying babies make you feel uncomfortable, you're not you you are going to be really uncomfortable in this movie. <laughs> yeah, they're in a in a long plane ride. Also, if you have <laughs> a child, your neighbors are just going to think that you are ignoring it. <laughs> There is yeah. There's one part that almost felt comforting in a weird way, because everything's from that point has been red and dark, and then you go into this oh, bright, yeah. colorful world that's also covered with maggots. But you're almost like, ah, thank God I'm here. <laughs> like it almost feels like uh, the, the, his uh, light at the end of the tunnel, but then it just goes right back into uh, this well, world. Well, that's. It's a great example to to bring up. Um, I can't believe that we didn't. I mean, I guess we didn't really get to that point in the movie. A lot of what we're talking about is like is set up in the first half, I guess. The second half, it does have a story to it. And, you know, I kind of wonder, OK, this is not a movie that it's not a spoiler type of movie. It doesn't matter <laughs> if you know what happens or what doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. Oh, no. When because... I Because I had fell asleep originally in the first half, not because it was boring or anything. I was just really tired. And I watched it, um, but it kind of sent me back to the very beginning. But I told Leanne, right. I was like, I can literally put this at any part and it still <laughs> would be OK because there's no actual story to this. Yeah, it's just the visuals. So I'm going to say this. If you just desperately want to avoid any discussion about what happens in the movie. Okay, I guess you can skip from here. But I would say it's recommended for you to check it out. Just, I mean, honestly, just to see it. It's streaming uh, uh, on Shudder. I mean, you should have Shudder anyway. This is great. Um, but I would recommend it. It's 85 minutes. It is, uh, it's uncomfortable, but it, it's also, I think it's more interesting how you absorb it, how you see it. So it is well done in a way that we don't really see in a lot of movies. And I feel like sometimes it's a little refreshing to see something that doesn't have a strict narrative to it. And is a little bit more, um, <laughs> that you want the challenge of reading into it yourself a little bit. There's no wrong reading to it. I think that's kind of the point of it. And, and even the term mad God I feel like even if he has a point to it, it could be, an angry God, or it could be a crazy God and God could be an actual God, or it could be, you know, uh, uh, the God of life, you know, whatever the, the, you know, life as a singular entity. Cause in that thing, when you kind of go down, it's going down to this microcosm. It's very beautiful. It's very pretty. 
And that's what I mean about seeing different, uh, different levels and different sizes of different things, because there's a particular character that looks through like a magnifying glass to see this thing, right? Yeah. It was a magnifying glass, not a telescope, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was a magnifying glass. See, this is this is my point is that even my recollection of it is still a little a little hard, but it's more about the feeling that it gave you. So, let's do our best to run through. You let's let's do this now. Maybe I'll put some music to this. Let's try to wrap this up by talking a little bit about what happens from point A to point B. Okay, right? We start there's a big mountain. Yeah. There's some lightning. Uh there's an encroaching black cloud uh kind of thing. And uh, what happens? The uh, scripture comes up, rises up. You and you're reading it, and it's all about how God does these. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna rip you apart. Yeah. It's it's like a it's like Macho Man Randy Savage. <laughs> if he was God, I'm gonna tear you to pieces. I'm gonna strew your your that's your Sammy Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm gonna snap you like a slim jim. I'm gonna rip your arms <laughs> off. I'm gonna tear your head out and I'm gonna spit down your throat. <laughs> I'm gonna do the because I'm the mad god. <laughs> Good wrestling. It's an name. excerpt from Leviticus. And then you get into this thing where you see this guy who's uh, uh Oh, I can't believe we didn't even talk about like isn't there a whole thing with um <laughs> with cannons right uh, isn't there cannon fire oh uh, yeah shooting up to yeah okay so you, you just think you're to, in this a kind of uh, post-apocalyptic oh god i can't say it which is what Bro. made me think of boxhead and roundhead by the way ah okay the brothers in arms uh short go ahead and as he's going along i think this was in the very beginning you see this kind of a uh, mummy guy that comes out of a a, a tube and then he's immediately eaten by this big toothy monster. And <laughs> this is a, this is like a bedtime story to, to horrify children before bed. And then it kind of just leads on from there. You do have like this almost tour guide. It's a gas mask like soldier guy that's going around. He's the one that we call the assassin. Yeah. You don't really know what's going on. He's uh, he's looking at a map and the map is falling to pieces. Every time he opens it up, it's falling apart. And he's passing all of these creatures, all of these things that are uh, destroying each other, that are eating each other. Um, he's, uh, uh, as he descends lower and lower into this planet, I guess. When he gets down to the bottom, he plants a bomb and he goes to set it off. And then oh, here comes this creature, grabs him, takes him away. Is the bomb going to go off? It ticks down to like one second and then just ticks back again. And it just keeps going back and forth uh, around that one second. Never goes off. Yeah. Right? That's the first like third, I guess. Uh, You consider that like a a short. Then we find out that he was taken to, right? This place uh, where this guy does these surgeries um, and he's ripping people apart. I to to spelunk into their guts and try to find something, right? Yeah, and he has like a an assistant with him, and at some point he removes a baby from uh, from a corpse and worm baby, a worm baby. It's just this hairy worm with teeth, and I think it's like a glow worm from nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I guess the nurse uh, takes it over. Um, God, yep. it's so weird. I'm trying to like piece everything together. Piece it all together. But like the movie, it's just like a hodgepodge, podgepodge. That's what we say. Of of just like a hodgepodge. I, I do like the podge hodge though. <laughs> um, so, yes. So then, I even before that, we should say that there was like a an, an old uh, silhouette um, uh, play thing that was done where it's this audience that is watching oh. this surgery thing happen and laughter. Yeah. Which was so unsettling to see that. It was, yes. it was kind of bizarre. That might be one of the more unsettling things because it's so understated. It all happens in silhouette. And then, so the baby gets taken and, uh, oh, here comes a pandemic 
<laughs> doctor thing with the you know the big crow's uh, mask, right? Yeah, the big raven mask takes the baby and floats away. And that scene is very interesting. It's it's very um, uh, kind of silent. You know, you have this big long trucking shot where it's kind of taking it off into this place where these bricks are uh, parting. Oh, yeah. It looks yeah. like death. Yeah. And then we have this other scene. We're introduced to this completely different character. Uh, character? Sure. That is this... <laughs> They they called him in the credits the alchemist. I think he has this big tumor on his head, and uh, I don't remember what he's doing. But he's got these two giant creatures with like cages on their head that they're doing something, and he's not happy with them. And so he flips a switch, and they get electrocuted. And that's where the <laughs> electrocution poop comes from. Okay, yeah, okay. I, I, for some, this is later on, I guess, because I, I was I was remembering the the two battling creatures. That were very oh yes yes yeah. oh correct. sorry uh, yes yeah I'm sorry but that's very the thing is that those two creatures I think those are the ones right aren't they I don't know or are they just the similar type of creature okay so that whole part maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm I'm starting to uh, forget a little bit of it but uh, yeah then uh, he is going to this different place you find out that this guy is trying to do something he's trying to get some stuff he's trying to make something right he's kind of doing this little research Uh, you basically find out that he is trying to I think create life right he's trying to create a a world and that's kind of where you get this like really pretty uh, thing I think that's something he made Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, is that, is that right? I, I was trying to get a story, drum a story out of this, but like, I, I, I guess that's what you saw. I just saw this is going to be another weird thing. So, I, I'm, <laughs> well, it kind of is. But there was that's a what task I'm I'm tra- happening. There was something that was exactly. There was like some kind of operation happening. Not you know physically the operation, but like there was. Well, also. Yeah. Yeah. There was. <laughs> Something going on, but then I guess yeah, maybe the baby represented uh, life, and I guess can I say the spoiler where they juice the baby? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so this is the thing: is that sure? It's we're in spoilers. We told people to they yes, they destroy the baby and turn it into like dust, right? (laughs) And so you have. I think it was a liquid. Oh, was it, liquid? it was a I liquid was, that formed. I thought it was like sparkly, glittery dust that he like then. It was a liquid oh, that no, formed into like into... a silver brick. Yes, yes, yes. But then they turned that into dust. And that is what the uh, pandemic doctor guy throws into space or something. <laughs> uh, so combine. So this pandemic doctor guy with the alchemist guy. Uh, they kind of combine forces, I guess, and uh, with the with the final piece of the puzzle, this baby, they like destroy it and then throw this dust across the sky, and you get this, uh, you know, Big Bang thing <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> uh, a bunch of uh, uh, vignettes. Uh, I, I've been using the word vignette a lot, but these uh, a bunch of visuals that get strewn together there's planets there's a a spaceship that flies by and it's it's very clearly like a big bang it's the creation of a universe right and um there's the 2001 by the way also because there's a uh oh, there's this almost matrix babies in the in the well no I, what i meant is the 2000 oh I, I yes that's true yeah the baby from um uh the cosmic baby but no the monolith right that square thing. Oh yeah. Uh, the yeah. Rectangular thing flies down, hits the planet. Then you get this montage of creating life. That's where the cellular division and everything happens. And, and we start to see cities, like cityscape, uh, something that looks like what we have today. And then there's these two li- Then we get more live action people. You get these two live action people uh, that are spray painting an anarchy symbol. And then they set off a bomb and uh, are they shot? I think they're shot by like some troops or something, but yeah. the bomb goes off, right? What happens? Is that the part where, um, where the assassin was riding around and there was a war zone going on? 
I think the beginning. So that's the thing is that it visually it looks very similar because what it happens went back is they set that. off. Yes, well, that's the thing is that they set off the bomb and then this Earth kind of uh, this planet essentially explodes. I think, and then yeah, you end up back along with the assassin kind of. Um, but it's it's a bunch of them, right? It's not just one. Yeah, or is it just one? I thought it was like a bunch of them, but I might be wrong on that. But then, yeah, you're kind of back to it. And then you see, and this might be actually another part of this new universe. You see like the, the, the bomb that had ticked down to one finally completes. And then it, that one it, it explodes. And anyway, <laughs> it's like the whole ending it's multiple kind of endings, but it looks like what they did is they created this baby. <laughs> they, or they, they found this baby in this guy. They destroyed the baby. They create this universe that destroys itself and then back again destroys that world, that universe. And I don't know if it's the same universe or if it's a microcosm of another one. Okay. So but it, I think, yeah, I think the message without really being a message is <laughs> war... Is, what is it good for? Yeah, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. War. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think yeah, the character represents the the ever uh, so the ever recurring reminder that war would always be a, a thing, and maybe um, the. I love that there's an ambulance is going by. <laughs> At this exact moment for me. I don't know if you can pick it up on the microphone, but there you go ahead. But then the creation of, of life and but but within the creation of life there's still uh torment. There was no I, there was no uh positive aspect about uh much of anything in this in this movie. And I wonder yeah, like you said, maybe it is a very nihilistic uh view on just the creation of man, I guess. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, yeah, because you had these like, you had these nice things that you would see created by these, this like monstrous thing. So he could be the mad god or the one who destroys the universe could be the mad god. Or it could just be since uh, this universe was created by a completely different universe uh, with the hopes maybe of it being better, yeah. but then it just ends up being just as bad in a different way. Maybe the mad god is just like, it's it's just <laughs> a copy of a copy of a copy and it's always going to be like terrible. Things just happen. There yeah. is no reason for it nihilism it could be that i'm sure that there's other readings to it but one thing i'm surprised we didn't mention earlier the monkey oh my god (laughs) (laughs) oh yes yeah the the creepy monkey who was there oh and then also the doll uh who was in the cage who just like looks at very uncomfortable close-up of that doll yeah lots of uncomfortable close-ups see that was very brothers quay the the doll yeah exactly there's a there's a lot of things like that i think in the movie i feel like we can probably wrap this up the the animation was good we didn't really talk about it that much i want to i want to shout out the uh compositing i thought the compositing was was very good without without that i think the movie could have felt a little bit more um it didn't feel it felt cohesive in a way that it might not have if you didn't have the um, the, the compositing that kind of uh, pulled it all together the the lighting the 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 look of everything the combining of the live action and the stop motion and even the stop motion i i kept looking at this going i wonder they would have the assassin character though obviously with stop motion walking around and then you have these insert shots like i know one of them definitely was live action where he was like like trying to fiddle with the map and i was like well that's definitely live action yeah i don't think you're going to be able to animate that but then there was another shot from a very similar angle later in the film where he is doing something with the map and it's like disintegrating his hands and it's falling i was like well that's definitely stop motion so it it's like the same shot but one is done with a guy in a costume and the other one is not yeah and there were certain parts where he was animated where it looked like you ever seen something uh, in 60 frames per second where it kind of looks yes like, very yes right very there are moments yeah. of his movements like that 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 look like they the frame rate would change back and forth with him 
And that could be the go motion thing. I mean, some of it felt uh, 12 frames a second. Some of it felt 24. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of, but it, in a weird way, that's what I mean about the compositing. Is it, it all felt purposeful. It felt on purpose. It, it didn't feel, it felt cohesive, even in a world that felt very... Um, uh, awful yeah. <laughs> the world the world is not a nice place to be in <laughs> um so yeah I, I thought visually it was very good and it's just one of those things that you just want to just just check out and not everything needs to have uh, a narrative to it whatever you take out of it is whatever you take out of it I, I will say don't watch it during the day because it's very dark and you're not gonna be able to see anything yeah <laughs> I definitely would. I do want to see this again because I, I feel like there's a lot of things I might have missed. You should watch it again and you should watch it with headphones on. You should just like mm. immerse yourself in it. Watch it by yourself with headphones. And I bet you'll have a, a better appreciation for it. And take some mushrooms. I would advise you not to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As if that wasn't a bad trip on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Rubber Any Animation Podcast. What a weird way to go from <laughs> talking about this movie to this uh, really fun, uh, festive music that I got going on right here. But uh, before we leave, I want to hand it over to my friend, fellow animator and co host, and uh, oftentimes stop motion animator, Mr. Rob Yofo. Tell them how they can follow you on the internet and where they can find your mad god. Uh, creation. Oh, definitely want to dabble back in the, Not official. In, into the stop motion world. But yeah, you could find me at Rob Ufo on Twitter and Instagram and uh, on YouTube. And uh, that's about it. And, uh, and and other things. I guess TikTok as well. I got a lot of uh, mixed media stuff, much like Mad God. Uh, <laughs> Steven Brooks, how So about- this thing, do you not want to say the thing that you're just about to release? Oh, because yeah, yeah. You will have released a special animated short. Why don't you yes. tell them? You it? might know it from his book. Also post-apocalyptic kind of uh, oh, uh, yeah. crazy world. That is Perfect. also Go. disgusting as well. <laughs> um, you might know the, the viral hit that I put out, Beavis and Butthead, uh, Arkira. It's a mashup. And um, I, it's coming out today at noon um, at the, as we speak right now. And I'm very excited for everyone to see it. Right. So it will have already been up. You got to check it out. It's called But Kira. <laughs> And I've seen the development of the whole step of the way. It, it looked really fun. I love the uh, transformation animation. It's very, very good. Congratulations. Also, you can try to find uh, his animation of Popeye beating up a baby at some point. That also. That oh, I think like I got rid of that. <laughs> that, would, that, would be, that would be totally at home in Mad God. Um, I'm Stephen Brooks. I'm the Rubber Onion. You can follow me at Rubber Onion everywhere. Just go to rubberonion.com, uh, hashtag Rubber Onion Podcast, uh, everywhere else. And check out the Patreon. Obviously, look for Rubber Onion. There are multiple tiers up there now. You can sign up for any tier that you want. And you can uh, be on the Discord. And we've been uploading a lot of stuff to Discord. We've been talking a lot on Discord. And if you want access to these episodes a week or so before they are up to everyone else, go to Patreon. Thanks, everyone, for listening Please watch both of these movies. I, I would say right after another. Watch Michelle the Show at the daytime and watch Mad God at night. Watch Marcel the Shell. Michelle Michelle. I, I feel like we got to come up with a name for this thing, but it, it does feel like Michelle Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> it just has to be the name of the episode. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for joining us, everyone. We will see you uh, or I guess talk to you next week. Bye.